Well, I've been wondering, thinking about where we are right now, you calling that a depression, aren't we headed to something far worse than that? And that go, of course, depending on how long this lasts, but if it lasts, let's say for six months, eight months, a couple of questions. Do you think the government can afford to continue to stimulate the market by giving people and corporations money. I mean, right now they're talking three to four months. What if this thing goes much longer than that? What happens well, to everything? Uh, well, those are good questions that there aren't any clear answers to. As you no, noted, uh, no. <laughs> part of my background in uh, early 1998, the president, President Clinton, uh, asked me to come back to the government after I had been the deputy director for management at OMB to take on the challenge of dealing with uh, the year 2000 uh, crisis, as it was called, uh, trying to figure originally how to make sure the government transitioned uh, smoothly to the year 2000. And then as you thought about it, you said, well, if the government works and nothing else works, it doesn't help people much. So we then ended up taking on the entire critical infrastructure of the United States, power, telecommunications, transportation, pharmaceuticals, you name it. And I thought, well, the UN or somebody will take care of the world. Uh, but by the summer of 98, it was pretty clear nobody was. And so we ended by, up by default um, running a global consortium of countries, uh, ultimately 170 of them, uh, working together to solve that problem. Uh, it ultimately uh, worked well. We had millions of people around the world working on this issue. My office was relatively small. My goal and my role and responsibility was try to organize and facilitate the work of all those people, to coordinate it, uh, to make sure it got done, and to make sure that the public understood exactly the state of progress. So we had to convince industry groups uh, in each of those critical uh, areas to work in a constructive working partnership with the federal government. The Department of Transportation, for instance, had planes, trains, and automobiles. The Department of Energy worked with oil and gas and electric utilities. And they worked cooperatively trying to free up the flow of information and make sure that everybody who needed to was paying attention. Uh, but what you had to protect against was, as I used to say, is the people who had systems that needed to be fixed had to fix them, but at the same time, you couldn't risk panicking the entire pa public uh, who would fear that, wow, the whole place is going to shut down there, and uh, Federal Reserve was working with us responsible for financial institutions in their partnership, and they issued in the spring of 98 a billion dollars of additional uh, paper money, and they announced that because they were concerned that people wouldn't have a run on the bank. I thought, well, that's an interesting strategy. Either people are going to say, wow, this is really going to be a big problem if they're printing a billion dollars now. But on the other hand, what really happened was people thought, well, okay, if they're printing money and they're preparing, then we don't have to go down and take money out of our accounts. Uh, <clears throat> the money will be there. The ATMs will have, uh, have resources. So all of that worked together uh, to allow us to get through that transition relatively easily. There were things that didn't work on New Year's Eve, the defense intelligence satellite system went down, the low level wind shear detectors at major airports in the United States went down while I was in the air flying to show I was confident the system would work. Uh, the Japanese lost the ability to monitor the safety systems on their nuclear plants. Uh, all, of thing, all of those are things people cared about um, and tried to fix. And it was my example of why everybody working on it knew this was really a problem. But ultimately it went smoothly enough that if you asked a lot of people then and even now, they say, well, that was just kind of a lot of uh, a hoax. It was an overreaction. People didn't need to do all that. But as I've said, I don't know anybody who worked in a telecommunications company, a financial in institution, uh, <clears throat> a power company, uh, that thought they wasted any time or money fixing that problem. So when you roll that forward uh, to where we are today, um, you know, it's that, that was not a health crisis, but we were concerned about pharmaceuticals, hospitals, people who depended upon uh, information technology. Our prediction was easy enough to make, was that in the years coming, we were gonna become more dependent on information technology. We we're gonna become more interconnected nationally and internationally. So anything that began to affect systems, uh, transportation and commerce uh, was gonna have a global impact. So that's where you are today. And I think, Part of our challenge is that we do not have a national response. 
uh, what we've got, as I put it, is kind of everybody left paddling their own canoe. So you've got governors doing the best they can, mayors doing whatever they can, hospitals uh, doing what they can. Uh, but it's kind of episodic. Everybody's kind of been heading to the same direction of, well, okay, we need to shelter in place. Uh, we need to close things down. Uh, but it's not happening in an organized way. And now we're talking about, well, when can we open it up? And it is an important question. Because just as at the front end of Y2K, at the front end of any major challenge like uh, the coronavirus, uh, you have to say, what are the risks that we know and what are the costs of dealing with those risks? Uh, you know, the world spent uh, several hundred billion dollars dealing with the year, year 2000 challenge. Uh, and uh, again, the judgment was made, and I think it was correct that that was important. Otherwise, you couldn't risk uh, the damage to the economy, to people that was going to happen if systems began to fail. Here at the front end, uh, you know, there was some question, is this a serious uh, issue? Is it really going to be a pandemic or is this the flu kind of writ large a little and can we let it go? Uh, the problem with, for people in charge in the administration at the CDC and other places is that, as we've seen, if you wait too long, uh, the problem gets away from you. Uh, right. It gets to be much more difficult to solve. So to where your question, it's a long uh, detour. Uh, to your question about what's going to happen next, clearly <clears throat> the stimulus package being passed uh, will help fill the gap. It will provide uh, support for those who are becoming unemployed, it will provide support for small businesses, it will provide support for large businesses, particularly uh, loans that will allow them to roll over debt and to continue to function while demand has disappeared. Uh, in, in a lot of places, major places, California, New York, uh, everything is closed except for grocery stores and pharmaceuticals. So the problem is, uh, we now know it's a pandemic. We now know if you look at the spike of cases and the spike of deaths around the world, as well as in the United States, uh, that this is a real problem. It's a real challenge. Part of that challenge is because it's so immediate. Uh, the concern in healthcare situations in hospitals, obviously, is if you spread this over a year, you could deal with the number of cases and the number of seriously ill people uh, more easily. But you put them all in the hospital at the same time and you exhaust uh, healthcare workers, you exhaust the supply of ICU beds, hospital beds. So you'd like to get the economy open, but on the other hand, you worry if you open the economy, are you reopening uh, the spread of the pandemic and the spread of the virus? Uh, so I think at this point, uh, as you say, you've got people estimating that uh, in three to four weeks, uh, we might be able to open things up, but other people say this is going to be June, July, or August. The consensus by economists is that this stimulus package, $2 trillion is a lot of money, even in Washington terms, uh, will go a long way to alleviating the immediate problems over the next few weeks. The unemployment insurance payments go for uh, up, to, up to four months. Uh, but it is clear that until we get uh, the curve flattened, as they say, and, and are satisfied that we have enough testing uh, to understand where the clusters are that are uh, generating the massive, uh, significant amount of uh, infections, uh, it's very dangerous to start having people wander back outside. As I've said, if you suddenly open uh, <clears throat> the floodgates and let everybody wander around, what you give uh, to us is all of us have the chance to all get the virus on our own at some theater event, some uh, church gathering. Uh, and so I think one way to measure it is the key is testing. If you look at the countries that have done well, they tested a lot early. Uh, they took it seriously. Uh, we let it get ahead of us for a while, and then we had problems with our testing. Never been clear to me why we didn't just get the tests that South Korea was using or the World Health Organization was using and just buy a lot of those. But the relevance of the testing is you've got to test a lot of people, millions of people, to be able to isolate where these uh, people who are affected or at risk of being affected are, and then you have to isolate them. But once you've got that pretty much under control, you then have more flexibility to say, okay, we can see that in these states or these cities or these counties, uh, it's safe for people to go back to work. They need to measure, monitor themselves, and if they feel sick, need to immediately quarantine themselves. But we're not there yet. We're starting to test um, significantly more than we uh, were, obviously, even two or three weeks ago. But I think until we get our arms around that and begin to have a scientifically, medically-based analysis and ability to control uh, what we're doing, uh, then it's a high-risk uh, venture. But on the other side of the coin, and I think it is fair 
uh, to con be concerned about the impact on the economy, that if everything is shut down, the longer it's shut down, the deeper the recession is. And so I understand those who say, well, gee, we just got to open up sometime in the next three or four or five weeks, uh, because otherwise the problem is going to be worse than, uh, and the cure is going to be worse than the basic challenge. Uh, but that's a tough balancing act. I think the best comment made recently was the virus will set the timeline. There's yes, no way to, I love that comment. And nowhere independently for us to wish or hope that it uh, was something different. So I think your question basically is uh, an important one. I don't think anybody knows the answer today. I think people can tell you that if we're still talking about this at this level, uh, come June or July, it's going to be time for another uh, uh, stimulus package because you're going you're gonna to have run through the four months uh, of unemployment support. You're going to have run through a lot of the SBA of small loans. Uh, that allow small businesses to, in effect, uh, roll all of this forward, but they can only roll it so far before they're going to need more assistance to keep it going. Uh, so it's, um, notwithstanding the naysayers that still exist, it's a serious challenge and a real problem. Uh, if you're in California, New York, Louisiana today, uh, you're not uh, debating whether it's an issue, you're trying to figure out how to get through it and how to protect yourself. Well, I love talking to you because, first of all, you've managed something big like this. Uh, so you have some real experience. Secondly, you have some insight into the financial piece of this that most of us do not have. But we sit here and worry because we think, how long is it going to take to really get this stimulus money to people? You know, I, I worked for the government in the sense I worked for housing authorities from 1963 to 1980. And I do know that uh, government doesn't usually turn the wheels very fast. So I'm thinking, okay, if I am in a renter situation or in a mortgage situation and I'm having these bills start to pile up, I'm, I'm worried about feeding my family, of course, but I'm also worried on this side about when am I going to get this money? And if it takes two or three or four months to get me the money, you've got a problem on that side. On this side, uh, I worry about things like uh, the deficit, where we already created a, a further problem, in my opinion, by giving this huge tax cut to the very wealthy people. And so we've deepened it further over here. How many trillions can we afford to do to continue this, even though it may be absolutely necessary? Can we afford all this? So that's a, a lot for you to answer. but. Give us your thoughts because you're so smart. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. But what I would say, it goes back to my experience at Y2K and here, is I think uh, as long as there's those kinds of uncertainties out there, uh, you are going to have a lot of people uh, worried appropriately about how they're going to get through it. And so I, that's why I think we need um, kind of a national approach to this where people can say, okay, the mortgage companies, the banks, the financial institutions are all working together with the government to say, okay, here is the problem. Here's how we're going to deal with these issues. Uh, <clears throat> you could, in fact, easily say, okay, if, if mortgage companies defer payments, if landlords defer payments, they then have their own problems. They've got yes. debt that they're rolling over. And so what you need to do is be able to have a concerted, organized effort that says, okay, we'll roll all of that forward and the Fed will backstop uh, the payments and the, and the debt that's out there in the public domain for whatever time it takes uh, to get us from here to there. And I think if people thought somebody was paying attention to all this in an organized way, people would feel much uh, more uh, relaxed about it. But I think the issues are real. On, and a lot of times, uh, people don't understand what it's like for people living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you know, the estimates are 40% of people in the United States uh, live paycheck to paycheck, cannot afford a financial hit of $400 or more. And, you know, if you're unemployed, $400 a hit uh, just showed up. Uh, so I do think on that side of it that um, those are real problems. You can't simply say, well, well landlords don't collect rent because then the question is, okay, what's the landlord do with their debt? And the same with mortgage companies. But on the other hand, if you were going to backstop things, uh, you could do it in an organized way and say, okay, there's a certain amount of debt coming due. We're just going to roll it all forward uh, for whether that's six weeks or eight weeks. And then people will catch up. It doesn't mean you don't ultimately at some point have to pay. It just means you're allowed not to have to pay it uh, under stress while you're unemployed and before the benefits come. 
to your point about the government working or not working, as you noted, I was the uh, commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service from 2013 to 17. Forget about that. <laughs> so I've been uh, spending some time on the phone <laughs> with uh, newspaper uh, and blog writers and others for the last couple of weeks dealing with, okay, how does this work? Uh, and I, I can tell you that it's complicated, uh, but the great thing is, while they you know, get uh, grumbled about a lot, the IRS has, as I've said, uh, as good a workforce as anyone I've ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot of workforces over 45 years, and it's a can-do agency. So I'm confident that they're gonna do whatever it takes to get this out as quickly as they can. Uh, I hope, and then I'm sure they've been planning for this, because we've been talking about it for the last two or three weeks as the Congress has been kind of trying to figure out how to get it all done. They still haven't finally approved it. Uh, but the biggest question is how do you find the people? You have to decide what the limits are and people have talked about it and ultimately decided 99,000 for a single person and 200,000 is where it fades out. Uh, and basically it's in the range of people making 70,000 or less. So you need to know what that class of people is and then you need to know where they are. Uh, and the IRS has a database, if you filed already this year, of either, at probably both, your address, and if you provided it, uh, your bank routing information. But if you haven't filed already, um, and a big chunk of people haven't, and now have been allowed to delay filing, um, then you worry about using last year's filings, put the, merch, uh, put the two databases together, because it used to be 20% of people moved, we're a little less mobile now, but 10 to 12, 15% of people change their address every year or a lot of them change their bank accounts. But nonetheless, uh, the best is the enemy of the good. I think the right thing to do is uh, to take anybody who hasn't filed already, take a look at what they filed last year. If they've moved, the check is gonna get sent back or the bank routing, the bank will route the money back if it's not the right account. Uh, but the vast majority of those addresses and wire transfers will work. Uh, the challenge is there are a lot of people who don't file because they didn't earn enough money uh, to have to file. And so you have to find those people. And the IRS works regularly with Social Security to exchange databases. Uh, so if you paid Social Security taxes, uh, with any luck at all, your information there in the Social Security Administration is updated about where you are. Uh, certainly if you're uh, uh, getting uh, Social Security benefits of one kind or another, uh, Social Security in most of those cases has wire transfer information. So you can add to the database of the IRS. So I think while there were people saying, well, we're gonna get this done in a couple of weeks, um, that's probably a little on the uh, uh, wishful thinking side. And on the other hand, in the past, it's taken uh, up to two months to get it done. I don't think it's gonna take that long. I think even with the IT challenges the IRS has because it's been underfunded for the last 10 years by the Congress, uh, I think those reprograms, reprogrammings can get done, uh, but I kept reminding the reporters, you gotta remember this is the middle of filing season, and so the IRS has a lot of things to do, and then it's struggling with the issues of how to protect its employees from the virus. So it's closed its walk-in centers, it's had to close uh, a lot of the call center operators because they were working you know, right on top of each other. Uh, so that's a challenge, but if I were going to trust anybody to do this, I have a lot of confidence in that agency and those people, uh, and they understand the seriousness of it, and they're going to work hard to get these fundings out. The other side of the equation uh, is something that's worried me for a long time, even before I got to OMB at the Office of Management and Budget and worried about the federal budget. Uh, when I was there, <clears throat> it started in 94, the Bush, uh, first Bush administration had ended and left the government with $200 billion deficits that looked like they're gonna run as far as you could see. And we all thought that was far too much. Uh, it tells you how <laughs> ironic it was that we're not talking about, uh, before the stimulus payment, a deficit of well above a trillion dollars this year. Uh, there is a new monetary theory that it doesn't matter, the government can print as much money as it wants. Uh, I can't say I believe that, it'd be nice if it were true. But I think ultimately my concern is when you have a $20 trillion deficit uh, or debt and you suddenly are gonna add two or three trillion to it, uh, at some point those chickens are gonna come home to roost yes. and we're gonna have to deal with it. And you're right, uh, giving uh, the Bush administration, uh, second Bush administration had a huge tax cut that ramped up the deficit. We then had the financial meltdown that increased the deficit and then we had another, you would think another tax cut on top of all that seemed a little un unwise if you were worried at all about uh, balanced budgets. 
and uh, deficits. I always ask, what happened to all those Republicans who used to talk about balanced budgets uh, when they were uh, suddenly in control and uh, spending money uh, like there was no end to it? So I do think it's ultimately a problem we have to deal with, but I would agree now is probably not the time to decide, well, we're not going to do the stimulus because we can't afford it. Um, at this point, the nature of the challenge is serious enough if you have a major depression uh, that by itself will run a deficit up far more than the stimulus package. So I think the right priority is to solve the problem of the pandemic, ensure to the extent you can that you stabilize the economy, provide support to people who need it. Uh, they're unemployed, they're low income people who are struggling paycheck to paycheck, week to week, to try to make sure that you make their lives as tolerable as you can in this period. And then when the dust settles and the economy's back uh, to a more steady state, Take a hard look at the deficit and don't nonchalantly assume we can just keep giving rich people tax uh, breaks uh, and it doesn't matter. Well, thank you so much, John. You know, you've given us just valuable pearls of information. You really have, and we really appreciate it. I do kind of feel like you got cheated out of some of your history. So, I'm wondering if we can circle back at some point and talk a little bit about the past with you, but I wouldn't have missed this part for anything in the world. Oh, you're very kind to say no, that. I'm <laughs> serious. It's wonderful. Uh, just to think that there's somebody out there like you that has the breadth and the depth of understanding of it. Are you available? Has anybody given you a call? <laughs> they should have. <laughs> Nobody's called yet, but if elected, I'd run, and if uh, nominated, I'd serve. Good for you. Good for you. Well, thank you so much for participating. It's been my great pleasure, Nan. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to have this discussion.